Hello, everyone. Sorry. Yes. I um, appreciate this is second day post-lunch, so energy might be a bit low. Um, so what I might ask is for us all to give ourselves a round of applause. Oh, that's, that's amazing. I, I, thanks. They probably think they're missing out on something amazing next door. Um, I was going to encourage people to get to level four, but you were there before me, so that's thank you. Um, so originally this was called transformational one-to-ones, but yesterday I learned that's a bad word uh, because it, it, it implies you're like a, you, when you get to the butterfly state, that's it, you're done. But obviously that's not the truth. It's a continuous thing. Um, and so it, what it's called now is one-to-ones that can help individuals on their path to professional development and happiness <laughs> with a hint of impact in the wider team group slash org. Yes. Um, this is me. Yes, it is. Uh, and it's my, f it's, it's, it was November and someone put it on a mug, don't ask me why. Um, so I'm an agile coach. I've been called lots of other things in my time. Um, well, those to my face at least. Um, for the last few years, I've been an agile coach at a few scale up companies, um, which is probably a talk in itself. Um, those have been quite an experience. Um, I am not to be confused with Avi Paul, the uh, Indo-funk artist, <laughs> streaming on all good platforms. I mean, yes, check him out. It's pretty good. Um, so this is what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to talk about why I'm talking about this. There's going to be an activity. Then I'm going to start telling a story of something that actually happened, um, which will cover the one-to-one uh, -one approach. There'll be a bit of a quiz with some tips. And then there'll be the end of the story in conclusion. And apparently, I'm talking about it twice. OK, that's a mistake. Sorry. Um, so why am I talking about one-to-ones at an Agile conference? What's the first value statement of the Agile Manifesto? Individuals over. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So this is very much individuals and interactions. Um, and. So what I'm going to tell you is about a true story of how I joined a company as a program lead, which I joked was a scrum master with admin overhead, um, as I was introducing agile practices or help refining them. Um, and it was a very dysfunctional program. Uh, there was lots of um, anger. But by the time I left, they were very happy, high functional psych safety in place, and things were working a lot better. Um, largely because of the one-to-ones that we had in place. Uh, it was a key element. It wasn't the only thing, but it was a key element. And another thing, um, so I've been working in engineering leadership teams for my last few roles, and something that I've observed is there's a, a disconnect between leadership and people doing the work, um, and there's a lot of finger-pointing of, oh, our teams are not accountable, um, they're not... They don't care about stuff. They don't go that extra mile. They don't, you know, all that kind of stuff. And what it leads to is them becoming more dictatorial, which leads to more of an environment of fear, which means people who've been hired for their expertise, putting their expertise to the side and just doing what they're told, not being very, very happy about it, and the solutions not being great, and morale low and attrition. And what I'm hoping is with some of these themes I'm going to discuss that can help resolve some of that. Um, OK, it's, this is an activity. Um, I made this up at 1 AM last night, so <laughs> I'm not sure how it's going to go. Um, but if you can indulge me. So if, could everyone get in pairs, please? Okay, um, are you, is everyone in pairs? Yes, hands up, you're all in pairs? Okay, so within your pairs, could you designate a, a one and a two? So one of you is number one and one of you is number two. Is that good? Yep, okay, okay, so, you're one, that's excellent. Okay, so um, number ones, what you're gonna do is very easy, you're just gonna observe. Number two is gonna be talking about stuff. Just for a minute, 
number one, if you can watch how they talk about what they talk about. So listen to what they say, obviously, but also pay attention to their face, the general body language, the tone of voice, and just, just, just be very, just, just, just watch it. And number two, you're going to talk for a minute about something that makes you really happy. So something that makes you smile on the inside. So it might be like your favorite holiday or your favorite book or your favorite Agile Manifesto principle. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I know. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to give you a minute to talk about that. Have you all thought of something? Yeah. Don't think too hard. So yes, so go now. Okay. Okay, is everyone uh Are we all done? Okay, so uh number ones. Number ones. Any So what did you notice when number 2 was talking? Smiling. They were smiling. What else did you notice? Engagement. Yeah. Animation. Animation. That's awesome. So engagement, smiling, animation. How did you feel? Happy as well. You felt happy? That's really interesting. Yes? Can I ask a question? Yes. I'm not trying to throw John under the bus, but he actually arrived like a minute late. Is there somebody with an apartment? Oh, you can join us if you want. Yay! <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> the game's over now, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, it does. That's a friend. <laughs> Hashtag awkward. Okay, so what's interesting is this actually worked and I wasn't going mad at 1 a.m. Um, so for those of you who felt happy listening to someone else speaking and watching them, it's actually called neural resonance. So when you actually observe someone closely, how they're actually talking, their expression, nonverbals, your brain picks up on that and you start feeling what they feel and you start thinking like them. Um, was that a question? Just a one. Are we talking just about face to face one on Like right now, does it also work in hybrid remote context? So I don't know if the, the research was done about hybrid stuff, but I know that when I've been in one to ones online, I've, I've also felt something similar as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if, like, you know, someone's frustrated, I'll pick up on that frustration. Um, but yes, essentially, this is empathy. Okay. So <laughs> people tend to think of empathy as a very soft thing. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's rooted in science. So um, here's my story. So I joined this program as program leader, as I mentioned. As I mentioned, quite an aggressive team. Um, th the loudest people were getting their way. So the more experienced people were just shouting people down. The newer team members were hardly getting a word in edgeways. And that tone was set. When I joined, um, I was very lucky that my boss who's in the room right now, um, <laughs> warned me about what had happened previously, um, that people had come in and they had rejected them. Like, you know, they were just trying to do their jobs and help the team, but it's like, no, don't put your agile on us. Don't, don't give us scrum. Don't want none of that no nonsense, right? So I thought, okay, um, what do they want? So I just did what any scrum master, I thought, you know, I'm gonna have a catch up with you. Um, so I set up a monthly catch up with everyone in the program. Um, it was about between 20 and 30, I think it fluctuated. Um, some people more than once a month. And I just, no agenda, I just wanted to hear what they were talking about, just understand what they had to say. 
Um, and for some reason, um, they were very happy with these conversations. And there was an offsite where they said, yeah, we want more of these. And I was like, what, you want to speak with me? Like, what's, going, what's going on here? I, was, I noticed things were, in start, were starting to improve. And I was like, okay, what, what am I actually doing? So I started to think about it and break it down. Um, and so this is where we go into the format. And so what I was actually doing was a mix of coaching and mentoring. And the distinction between the length of the facial hair and how gray your facial hair is. Um, <laughs> no, the distinction being um, mentoring is where someone who's got lots of experience, where they're advising people to get towards a certain goal, whereas coaching is more, there's no advice. It's asking exploratory questions for people to arrive at their own conclusions. So you're, you're actively not giving them advice. And as managers, that's very hard because we think it's our responsibility to actually give them the answers. Whereas actually, it takes quite a lot of effort. And we'll go into why it's, it's important to not do that all the time. Um, so what were the questions I was asking? So usually when you have one-to-ones, a manager will come to the meeting with an agenda for the report. Right, this is what you're gonna do. Oh, and here's some action to get it done by this date. Um, so what I would do is ask, what would you like to discuss? So it's giving them the floor, giving them the agenda. And then you find out what is actually passionate, what they're passionate about, what, what annoys them, what makes them angry. Um, and these things surface. And it's, it's not you, it's you. And you're learning from them. They will know things about being in the teams that you won't because you're not there all the time. Um, sometimes I would say, got anything to discuss? It's like, no. So it's like, okay. Um, what's been going well? What hasn't been going well? what are your thoughts on this thing that you've been working on? They will have very specific thoughts about those things. Um, those are obviously very similar to retrospective questions, but it was just, you know, just giving them triggers to think of some stuff. Um, yeah. And then the next question I would ask would be, is there anything I can do to help? And so that it's very much a coaching question. And again, it's not helping them. You're going to actually create an action for them. It's like helping them with the actions that they've arrived at. And it's important for leadership to show their support to their people. Like we are there as leaders to help our people, right? The better they perform, the better it is for everyone. Um, yes. So the next question would be, what feedback do you have for me? What do you think I would get when I ask that question? Yeah, no, it's all right. Yes, you're good. Everything's great. Um, so it's important to try and phrase this more about specifics. So I would kind of ask, hey, this thing which, um, I mean, you know when you're not being good, right? Um, so it's like, oh, that thing, when I did that thing, oh, yeah, no, you mention it. And then they all of a sudden they got loads of feedback to give you. And it's like, well, all right, hold back. You know, it's, <laughs> Jesus. Um, but what's important is that leaders need to show vulnerability and humility in order for, because what I talked about this environment of fear previously, where managers go around acting as though they've got all the answers and everyone else isn't doing well enough. This is like leadership saying that, if you know Amy Evanson's work on psychological safety, uh, essentially what she talks about there is like, you know, one of the key elements is this vulnerability of leaders. Um, and so for me being in a program leads position saying, hey, how can I be better, it set the tone, and people were more honest about when they were having challenges and when they needed help. And I think that, that that's crucial to surfacing all the flaws in the system which we can improve collectively and overcome together. Oh, one other thing. If they complain about someone else, like, oh, Dave is doing my head in, I was like, okay, what's Dave doing? Okay, how can, we approach, how can you approach Dave and provide Dave that feedback? And then we talk through a process to actually provide that feedback. And then they'll go and have the conversation. They'll come back and say, yeah, that's great. And now we're best of mates. Um, and that would happen a lot. And what else? So this is a classic coaching question as well. This requires you to hold back and work with the, with the silence. Because what it does is the, the, the awkward silence helps them dig deeper and actually think more about actually what else is there. If you're thinking about actions, they will start thinking more creatively. OK, I could try this. It's like, OK, great. What else? And you want to ask this probably to the point where it's slightly uncomfortable. 
um, but they actually do benefit from this. And it's being curious. It's, again, not assuming that you know what's best, and it will take a lot of effort to, to hold back and not fill that gap. If you're looking for specific models on actions, these are two that I have used. I'm not going to go into specifics. There's plenty of information online about them. Uh, I would recommend either. Um, and, you know, giving them the... One of the main things is they come up with the actions from this. You don't come up with the actions. That, so, you know, when they come up with the actions, they're more likely to be motivated, they're more likely to be excited by them, uh, passionate, and they're more likely to be innovative. So managers will not be the ones who have the most creative solutions. It's the experts that you've hired that will be. And so this is crucial, for the generation of actions at least. Now, my opinion is managers and leaders should be a combination of coach and mentor. So I start with coaching because it's essentially giving them the platform to show this is for you, this is your space, you're driving this. But inevitably, you will have some observations given your experience where you could provide them feedback. Or there might be some agenda items such as, oh, there's a change in the hierarchy, whatever. There will be some one-to-one -one points which you will have. I would recommend bringing these in afterwards. Um, and likelihood is they'll probably raise a lot of the one-to-one -one points that you were expected to raise anyway because you know, they care about their jobs and they want to do well. Um, the feedback approach I would take, um, so bear in mind I was with um, very angry people. And so when people, particularly if they're very angry and emotional, hear that you want to give them feedback, the brain, the, the amygdala response, and that's the emotional part of the brain, it's like a fight or flight response, as I like, hell no. Um, so what I tend to do is frame the conversation with empathy to show that I understand their thoughts, how they're feeling, um, and what's annoying them. So uh, there's, some, there's, there's some advice from Chris Foss in his book, um, Never Split the Difference. Um, and he talks about labeling the emotion so paraphrasing what you hear, so they'll tell you why they're annoyed. You paraphrase it back, and then you label the emotion. And when you label the emotion, it takes it from the, the amygdala to the more rational parts of the brain. So that reduces the barriers and the fear. And then they're more open to the feedback that you have to give. Um, use language like it seems like, it sounds like, um, and that's that's generally what I tend to do with that. And um, psychotherapists talk about um, when people feel completely listened to, like totally heard, then they're more open to learning and feedback. And what I've learned is that there's three levels of listening. And the first level is internal listening. And so 80% of our conversations are, are this. So it's very superficial. You're just listening to respond. Oh, you went on holiday. That's, so did we. That was great. Um, <laughs> level two, listening to understand. It's like nonverbal observing. It's what you did earlier. It's the whole, oh, you went on holiday. Where did you go? Why did you go there? Great. Oh, they got childcare there. That's great. Level three is global listening. So it's kind of like using the force and like using instinct. It's like, oh, you, you chose a place with childcare. So you want to spend more time together? Okay, that's interesting. And do you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to go down that path, but you, 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 <laughs> you, yeah. Um, probably a really bad example. Um, you want to be thinking about your posture in the one-to-one. -one. So why did I choose this image? He's a handsome-looking man. He's a handsome -looking man. <laughs> Granted. So, I mean, he's leaning forward because he's writing notes, but otherwise it's quite neutral. It's quite a neutral posture. He's not wide like, yes, I'm in charge, or closed off like, oh, no, uh, something's going on here. It's quite neutral. Um, another thing which people enjoy is actually mirroring. I'm not sure if you notice when you're in your conversation. So what we tend to do on a subconscious level is we start to mirror the postures of others. And that's kind of like saying, like a subconscious signal that we're the same, we're similar. And that helps to connect as well. Um, there's a bit of a quiz. Um, so I'm going to show some facial expressions, and you're going to tell me what they are, what they mean. So what's he feeling there? Happy, yes. Uh, what's he feeling here? 
yeah, it's, 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 it's somewhere between being surprised and, yeah. Um, so the head to one side, the eyebrows are raised, uncertainty, curiosity. Uh, what about that one? <laughs> Sorry? Not happy. He doesn't look very happy, does he? What, I mean, the shape of his mouth, the eyes, it's kind of like... What? <laughs> hey, that's a great time. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, what about this one? The, it's disgust, almost. Yeah, so the, the, the nose is squeezed up, the eyebrows are down, the mouth is up. Um, okay, come on, clicky. <laughs> scared. scared. This one? Uh, I mean, he looks unhappy. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah but it, but let's, let's carry on. It, it, if you see that in your one to one, then there's, that's a HR thing, maybe. I, he's uh, thirsty. Let's go. Okay. So back to the story. So um, a bit of a metaphor here. So with the, with the lenses, the telephoto lens focus on the individual. So we talked about um, the one-to-ones that we are having, having them in charge of their destiny and their actions, etc. The wide angle and the team. So if you think about agile practices, which we were introducing, well, they're not calling them agile practices because they hated them. Um, it's about giving them the control and self-management. So it's, it's a similar theme. And at that ultra-wide lens, so with the whole group, I was just being very honest about what we were doing. It's like, I talked about Project Aristotle. I talked about psychological safety, five dysfunctions of a team, all these things. So it was like, this is what we're trying to get to. So they got on board because of that. It's like, just give everyone the information, your intentions. Don't patronize people. Don't kind of hide your intentions somewhere. Just, you know. Essentially, what we're saying is we want to get along, um, so why not share that? Um, so in the end, there's no ending. Um, the next state was they were very happy. Um, so there was more creativity from the team. So they came up with ideas um, from inside the team, which were very successful. They were much happier. Uh, they ran retrospectives without me being there, which was amazing, but they hated retrospectives before. Uh, there was more psychological safety. Some of the more quiet people were actually facilitating stand-ups and retrospectives themselves. Um, it was generally more productive as well. Um, so I've given this talk, well, a shorter version of it, at other companies, and this has formed part of manager training at some of the companies that I've worked for. Um, but some of the responses have been interesting. So someone said to me, if someone doesn't have the same values as you, then this isn't going to work. And I've heard someone asking these questions like, do you have any feedback for me? I think, no, that just does not sound sincere. So you genuinely have to want to help these people and understand why we're doing this. And the other thing is someone said this wouldn't scale. And I can kind of understand that. And it's because like, you know, if two people are having a conversation, and you know, they're engaged and they're benefiting from all of this, then how, how are they going to influence the wider group? Um, but what I would argue is that you know, if from senior leadership and all the managers were to employ this to actually have some empathy, understand the perspective of their people, and understand that they're not actually um, apathetic and not motivated, like you know, maybe. Maybe that person can talk to this person or something. Do you know what I mean? Get their perspective. Um, then what we should see is this culture spreading throughout the company or the group. So just to summarize, um, these are the themes. So if you think about the question of what would you like to discuss, that's empowering. If you think, if you think about what can I do to help, that's supporting. Uh, what feedback do you have for me? That's humility, vulnerability, and what else? That's being curious, giving them the space to be creative. But for me, like empathy is massively important and core to all of this. Um, all of these books have influenced me and my approach to a certain extent. Um, it started with the one on the left, Crucial Conversations. I would highly recommend that, and then obviously the rest of them are great as well. 
If there's one thing that I would like to ask of you is whether you're a manager, whether you're not a manager, whether you're a leader, it's like, what can you take away from this? What's the one thing you can start doing? Um, what was interesting that I didn't mention actually is that um, organically people within the team, within the group started to do these one-on-ones themselves in the same format. Like, and then that just spread. So without actually asking people to do that, it just spread. And then I think that was also key to their happiness as well. Um, thanks for listening. And do you have any questions? <laughs>
But the examples you gave were very much sort of in-person uh, coffee shop yes. observations on you know, virtual one-to-one. That's really interesting. Um, obviously, we're, there's the whole kind of um, fatigue, the, the Zoom fatigue. Um, I still tend to have just one-on-one -on -one video calls with people. Um, I still like to be able to see their reactions, um, as in their facial reactions and, and everything, the stuff that we talk about. So, yeah, I think that's, um, that's interesting. Um, there was a talk earlier about how much you can do kind of uh, async, um, but when things get more important or emotional, then that's a good time to do them. Uh, I think that's something which I might start looking into. We're done. Thank you. Thank you.